So thanks for coming uh, to this online meeting for this month. Um, I don't think Wayne's here. He's working. He's, uh, as usual, the COVID-19 stuff's uh, pretty much kibosh part of his company. So he's working hard trying to sort some stuff out. Uh, thank you to our sponsors, Hudson. Uh, Pablo's not here either. Again, he's under the pump. Uh, Scriptrunner and Instinct Technology for not the food this month, but just for their continued sponsorship. So uh, as usual, uh, we'll start with the PowerShell news. This is you, Michael. All right. So, <clears throat> sorry, there's a uh, fair bit to get through. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll kind of we'll kind of um, smash it out. Um, well, I quickly do that. I actually should have, I kind of did have some notes. So I'm just going to quickly up my note, open my notes so I can kind of go through some of them. Um, okay. So obviously, yes, um, everyone's aware of the human malware. Um, I like the word human malware because, um, yeah, it sounds cooler. Um, so essentially, um, all online, um, all meetup, um, events from this point forward will be online until we have the all clear. Um, so yeah, I think until once we kind of have a bit of a get together, then we might have a big shenanigans or something along those lines, but essentially, um, all meetups will be online going forward. Um, the second thing is we all work in uh, technology industry and, um, right now teams is getting stood up or any sort of video conferencing solutions are getting stood up, um, as fast as you can possibly think. And we are all incredibly busy, um, or Unfortunately, um, there's been mass layoffs um, as well, which is obviously a consequence of that. Um, it's really important to just check with, you know, check in with everyone, just make sure that they're okay. So I've been checking in with all our clients, checking with a lot of my mates, just making sure that that they have the required resources available. If they need my resources, um, that I'm just going to do it, um, help them out. So I think that's just really important. It's the same here in the user group. So if you obviously have any issues or you're needing help with stuff, um, don't be afraid to reach out. Um, we've got obviously plenty of talented people here to be able to actually assist. Um, and obviously there's, um, yeah, we've got a, we've got a pretty a really good community here. So um, if you're obviously doing it tough or things like that as well, um, so yeah, send us a PM, just send me a PM or send a couple of guys a PM and just have a bit of an event and that's totally fine. So yeah. Um, on some positive news, we hit 100 subscribers on YouTube. It's a small feat, but we got there after about a year. Uh, you raised your hand, Jordan? Question? It was, it was a yay. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, we got to 100 subscribers. So, um, that was a really hard push. Um, but, yeah, cool. It's a really awesome. So, basically, uh, starting to push a little bit more. Um, yeah, and also um, the PowerShell Conference Book Volume 3, Call for Papers. So if you're not aware of the PowerShell Conference Book, um, essentially it's a um, it's a book that's produced um, in partnership with uh, um, PowerShell.org, the DevOps um, Collective. Um, those are the guys who run the PowerShell Summit. Um, so obviously board members, Don Jones, um, Jeffrey Higgs. Um, and essentially what it is, is it's, it's a conference in a book. Um, so essentially you have... Um, you submit a talk and as a book, as a chapter and essentially, um, yeah, you'll write that chapter. So, um, we have published volume two. Now we're actually doing the call for papers for volume three. So if you have any unique wacky ideas, um, and we're not looking for, um, deep dive content this time, it's more going to be just focused on beginning, um, intermediate and advanced. So, um, that also includes the soft talks, things like that. Um, we're also looking for, so definitely if you have, um, if you have some all interesting material, um, I definitely encourage you to submit it. Um, Joel did a talk, uh, a chapter. Um, I had, a, I actually had, I had a proofread it. Um, Joel did a chapter of um, PowerShell's tokenizer, and that was one of the most interesting um, chapters I've ever read because he basically was breaking down the enums and pretty much the underlying C sharp on how it works. So it was pretty cool. Um, so there's other chapters um, in volume two, which was just talking about, you know, like um, WinRM, I talked about logging, um, PowerShell parameter sets. Um, honestly, like I, I can't remember a lot, but it's, it's, it's quite extensive. Um, speaking, um, we will quickly talk about that after. Um, PowerShell Summit has been cancelled, obviously, um, due to COVID-19. So officially or unofficially, the PowerShell Conference book volume two is technically the summit. <laughs> um, 
obviously, um, also in the news, PowerShell 7.1 preview release is out. Um, that's actually quite interesting. Um, so obviously, definitely um, have a look at that. And there's also some interesting new PowerShell features that have been coming. So they're looking at minimizing PowerShell. Um, it's kind of the start of that process. So it looks like they're, they're kind of starting removing a lot of um, breaking out modules so that um, the, the I can't remember exactly which ones, but essentially they're just breaking out those dependencies on PowerShell to improve the size of the um, um, of actual PowerShell itself. So that's actually really good news. So it means obviously we can um, significantly reduce our um, pipeline. Uh, you can re reduce the pipeline sizes and things like that. So yeah, um, it's also going to be improving, adding an interactive UI. It's going to have shell improvements, um, mainly surrounding handling strings. I haven't really dug down into the details on that yet, so I'm kind of um, I kind of just breezed over it. Um, it's going to add um, support for Jupyter um, as well as it's also going to add, um, it's going to do some um, changes to VS Code, PowerShell and editor services combined with PS Script Analyzer to support better inline linting in PowerShell um, VS Code. So um, those are some pretty cool features. Next one, prizes. So um, I've got some prizes. So we basically, um, I managed to get, finally get some prizes other than some lame as EK stuff. <laughs> but essentially, um, I'll just quickly show. So I've got a couple of shirts, um, which is essentially the shirt I'm wearing. Um, um, so basically, yeah, we've got some shirts. And I also ordered um, an additional PowerShell Conference Book Volume 2. Um, I'm going to be honest, this is a freaking big book. So oh, let me turn off the um, thing in Zoom because, oh, there we go. It's not, oh, I've got to stand behind it. So it's quite a large book. Um, and when I mean large book, um, it's um, approximately one cat length long um, with tail tucked up. So it's um, essentially, I don't think it's A4, but it's, um, yeah, it's pretty bloody big. So yeah, and it's got, you know, 600 pages of content so yeah so one of those books shirts things like that so obviously we can um i'm going to try and work out a way we can do those give as giveaways so yeah cool um call for papers for lightning talks for next month so next month we're going to do lightning talks um it was i was going to be away but i'm not so oh well it is what it is um but anyway um we'll be doing lightning talks next month so yeah call for papers so um make a real quick talk um, I know Ron is super keen not about that. He's been eyeing me, me. We don't really have any select themes, so you can pretty much just talk about whatever you want. So um, go bananas. Um, yeah. Is it going to be straight? Is it going to be straight uh, 15 minutes, or is it like 15 to 20 minutes is okay? Or um, I think it's going to be. Um, I think we just we'll just make it 15 minutes. That's a nice nice round number. Um, so you can just kind of blast uh, blast through that, and we can have. My settings. Oh no, that's Alex's virtual settings. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I think we just we just make it 15. If you go over, you go over. Who knows? Like I'm not I'm like I'm not going to hold anyone to like the Calapa award or anything like that. So, um, and then this Friday, um, I've decided with work. Um, we generally have a bit of a gaming channel at work, so I've decided this Friday we're going to do a bit of a CS:GO event. So we're going to call it, Can I was, I, was I was going to call it Canadian Club and Counter-Strike, but um, I don't think some of the guys are going to be drinking. So essentially it's just going to be, let's just have a bit of fun, play some video games, um, get get the sales manager at my work annoyed at me because I failed to defuse the bomb, which was really funny. Um, or just, just camp everywhere. Like that. that's a, that's a really fun, that's pretty funny as well. So um, yeah, if you're interested, PM me. Um, and we can, I can definitely send you the details to our Discord server and we can kind of get you guys sorted with that. But any ado, let's go on to the next slide. All right, tip of the month. Next slide. Um, well, there was actually a couple of other bits and pieces of the news. The new Microsoft uh, oh. Secrets Management modules in Alpha 2 now. Is it? Okay. Okay. And the name has changed as well, I think, for the secrets yes. uh, management module. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So if you try and use the old PowerShell gallery URL to install it, it fails. Yeah. PowerShell Get 3.0 preview also came out today. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it did. Yeah. 
That'd actually be interesting. That'd be really good. All right. Uh, anything else I missed? Because I missed a fair. Have you guys? Things. Anyone? Anyone started using the Windows terminal recently released? That is amazing. Uh, that yeah, is. yeah. Yeah. I use it every day. Yep. Yeah. yeah. That is beautiful. Uh, Yep, it's great because I use it with PowerShell, PowerShell Core, or PowerShell 7.1, but also Windows Subsystem for Linux. Yep, Shows me characters too. properly and all that sort of stuff. Yep. I've, uh, I've installed... You don't get those uh, weird font issues you get sometimes with WSL. Yes, yes. So I've installed some of the fonts. Um, we, we have to include the emojis. You have to create a new font using, I mean, uh, with the emojis, and I've installed new font, and... Uh, it does some really good syntax highlighting, especially if you're uh, if you have a repo which you have checked in uh, to Git, mm. so it would show you uh, the color coding whether the repo, I mean anything is pending, um, pending for commit or changed or those sort of things, which is awesome. Yeah. Cool. Um, cool. All right. Let's let's head on to the tip of the month. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about confirm preference and confirm impact. Um, so I'm just going to drag this to the right hand side of the screen to talk a little bit about this. Um, I'm just going to. Oh, oh, sorry, I'm just resizing things. No, not that one. I'm in full screen view. And now I'm completely broken it. I nearly clicked end meeting, which I don't want to do. And I will do that. All right. Um, share video. Okay, we'll just do it that way. So essentially, um, we'll quickly talk about confirmed preference and impact. So, um, is everyone here fairly familiar with confirmed preference and confirmed impact? Nope. Okay, cool. All right, we'll just kind of. Oh, I can pop it down the bottom. Well, that makes it so much easier. All right, sweet. So essentially, confirm preference sets the default confirmation prompt within PowerShell. So when you go into PowerShell, um, it's it's a predefined it's pre it's sorry it's a predefined variable that's used to actually yeah set the default com confirmation prompt. So when you're actually you know typing remove AD user, um, remove item, any any sort of um, any sort of command that actually leverages I confirm um, um, preference. I'm going to use that because this is kind of it, it's going to get a little used interchangeably. But essentially, what it does is it allows you to either um, it allows you to set the um, sorry, I was having a massive memory blank. <sighs> okay, it allows you to set the actual default um, confirmation for that. Item. So, for example, if you set a confirm impact on a function, let's say the function is it has a level of high, um, and you have a confirm impact of uh, low, it will prompt. So, it basically controls how the prompt is um, runs in PowerShell. So now there's four levels that are provided. So you have none, low, medium, high. So when you set the confirm preference to be none, what will happen in PowerShell is essentially it won't prompt for anything at all. Um, if you set for low, essentially the way it works is it'll prompt for the same level or higher. So if you set for low, it'll basically prompt for any um, function that has a confirmed impact of low, medium or high. So by default, PowerShell's um, confirmed preference setting is high. So you're only getting prompted for those items that are deemed high. Um, so if you set, for example, you create a, um, a commandlet, um, an advanced um, an advanced Commandment. You create an advanced function with um, confirm impact of medium, and you have your default preference confirm preference set to high. It won't prompt, and it'll just go ahead and remove it or make your change. The one thing about um, confirm preference is obviously it's just um, it really depends on uh, site to site, um, but essentially um, it's best practice to have low for um, servers, those kinds of things, because essentially you need to know what's going on prior to actually running it. Um, and then obviously high for um, non-volatile um, systems such as desktops. Um, does that make sense? With the the actual confirmation side, isn't yep. is that linked to the should process side, or is that Correct. whenever you have to call the 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 function? It's it's so you set the default commandlet binding, but essentially um, it is linked to the should process method. So. 
Um, it's kind of funny because I didn't want to talk about um, should process because essentially they, they are kind of used interchangeably, like, I would say interchangeably, but they are um, tightly bound. But essentially, um, in this instance, uh, yeah, we'll talk about should process another day. So, but they are bound together. So, um, yeah. That's pretty much that. So, any, any questions? No. And it supports it supports array as well, right? Um, so any any. So, so when you, when we create function and it, if the function accepts array, uh, more than one object, so it would process for each object, or do we have to do anything specific? Okay, so when you specify when you define the array within an like when, oh, sorry when you define an advanced function, so obviously you specify the command of binding attribute. Um, and mm -hmm. then put the, the argument confirming packed in. Essentially, you're telling PowerShell this is a high risk function. So it's basically a global, um, think of it as a global argument that applies to everything. So if you pass in an array of files, let's think of like remove items. So if you've got an array of mm -hmm. files that you need to remove um, and you pass it into, um, you pass it into your function, let's say remove item, because the confirm impact preference um, the confirm impact is high and essentially it will prompt for each of those files to be deleted because it's the way this, the, the function's been structured with the begin process and end blocks. Um, but essentially it's more, it's, it's, it basically tells PowerShell, hey, this is high risk behavior, you need to prompt. Um, but um, as Jordan mentions, it needs to be embedded, uh, it needs, you need to use the should process method. So um, yeah. Any other questions? Thank you. Cool. All right, let's keep cracking on. All right, arrays in action. I'm handing this over to Alex. Hello. Just turn that off. So arrays, explain arrays in action. Um, basically, my talk for this month. Basically, it's just a, a high-level overview of quiet Google. Um, just about what arrays are, how do we use them, how to create them, uh, how to navigate. Why has my phone started playing music? Okay. I'll just start off of uh, what are arrays? Uh, basically, arrays are one of the basic data structures within PowerShell itself. Um, it's basically a collection of values, objects, um, basically anything you want to collect together but be able to go through. Whereas, say, um, variable, you know, you just give it a string, that's just one thing, an array is a collection of those things. So it's a collection of things. Makes things easier to iterate over, manage, um, select, deselect, pull out, pull in, uh, things like that. And I probably, um, don't know about you guys, but I use arrays every day, I'm sure we all do, because um, they're just very, very useful. Uh, so this is a, a fairly demo heavy talk. Um, can everyone hear me all right? As far as I can. Yep, I'm seeing nodding. Yeah, that's great. Um, so it, it's essentially just going to be um, a set of, I think it's eight demos of. Uh, yeah. Yep. Who's over there? Yep. Hello. Uh, so yeah, so we'll just kick off straight away with let's create an array. Uh, as well. yeah. Let me. I'm probably gonna have to size this up, aren't I? Is that big enough? Cool. All right. So PowerShell notation to create an array is basically just at symbol with uh, open and close brackets. As you can see here, so we've got here first array that we're just going to create. Um, oh, I hate it when this goes mad. Yeah. Uh, and then we can check the type a little bit. Uh, we have a system array. So pretty simple. So anything you throw uh, between the uh, the at and the open and close brackets is going to get added to the array. Um, we'll get into it later, but at the beginning, PowerShell um, arrays are fixed size. So when you create them, they are that size. So you can't alter them after that point. Um, but we'll check into that later uh, once we get into performance and .NET arrays. 
So there's various ways we can create our PowerShell arrays. Um, so the second array we've got here is we're just changing the format uh, to make it easier for readability. And again, we just get the same output from that to get type with the system array object. Uh, some people prefer to break it down like that. Some people prefer it in line. Um, I suppose it depends on the readability of the script you're writing and how you want to basically keep it that way. You can also uh, create just straight without the at and the open and close brackets by doing a, just a straight line there, separated by commas. Uh, and again, just to show you, it's the same thing. Um, you can also, I think, pipe objects to write output and do it that way, but that's a bit funky. I'm not sure why you would want to do that, um, but you can do it that way. Um, and we see here, those are obviously just string values that we, we put in there. Um, you see here the uh, array over here, we're just going to get uh, a list of objects from the get service command line. And again, it's the same thing, system array object. But if we grab it, we can see it's just got all the objects in there compared to, say, uh, the first array, which has just got string objects. Yeah. Um, you can also create uh, objects just on the fly and add them between the uh, the at and the open and close brackets, just using the PS custom objects or however you would normally do it. Uh, there, is it here, put type, and then you've got our objects there, Frodo and Samwise. Um, and that's pretty much how easy it is to create a PowerShell array. Not a lot to it, um, just the, uh, the notation of the at and open close symbol. Generally, I would leave it in there because then it's easily readable that people know you're making an array, you're adding things to it, you know, you're doing something within the array. Does that make sense for everyone? Yep. Any questions? Yep. You can see the thumbs ups. It's great. Um, Oh, the second. Yeah, the second array. I I always thought you had to put a comma for each of the new line. I didn't know a new line would create it as a, like a separate entry in the array. In the array. Yeah, I mean, I think you can also put commas in, and it works as well. Yeah, you see, it doesn't like the last comma. Yeah, yeah. So you can... I, I, that's the way I always thought it had to be done. But it's cool that you don't have to. Yeah, that works. Um, I would imagine it would be. We can see. Wouldn't that just be readability? I mean, uh, if you do, if you declare it like first array, this makes it more clear that it's an array. Whereas if you do it like third array, um, yeah, that, that's not something I would approve on a pull request or anything. It just, it just looks. I don't know. Just I don't know personally. Uh, yeah, I generally just do it as the first or second because then it's easier yeah. when you're reading it. You're like straight away, it's an array. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so do test. Yeah. yeah. So you're right, Michael. Yeah, it comes out as an object when you import CSV. 
really just depends on the function of the commandlet. Like if they're outputting multiple objects, then you get an array back. But if it's only outputting one object, then there's no array. Oh yeah, we're only getting one back because of column one, column two. A little problem. Just one space. Yep. So part two, navigating simple arrays. So these are arrays of just values, uh, like string values compared to say objects. So we see here, we've got our, our first array, navigation array. Oh, I'm gonna turn my phone off because it keeps reacting to me talking. It's been on talking for deep. NSA night, it's the NSA. Uh, Facebook, they're after my ads. Uh, so a simple way to navigate these through is through indexes. Uh, so we've got the usual ones. Obviously, PowerShell arrays are indexed on zero. So item one will be zero. See that navigation array zero with the square brackets comes out A, which is the first one there. You can also access and walk backwards through an array by using minus. So minus one would be the last uh, item in an array. And you can go as far back as you want down to minus whatever the uh, uh, array is. Uh, you can also access a range of elements by going from um, X to Y. Um, so you see here, we're going from zero to two. So that'll give us ABC. So that's zero and two. And I realize I'm pointing at the screen and you can't see me. And then you can also access specific elements or multiple elements. You can see here we're accessing elements one and three. So we should get B, zero, one, two, and three, and D. Get B and D there, and you can chain those together as well. So you can get multiple ones, and you don't have to do them in order. So you can get zero, four, nothing like that. So you can return them in, in any way you want, really. Um, if you want to know how many items you've got in the array, uh, you can count, but you can also use the get at a time. Uh, and that will give you your service index number. And then, obviously, you've got the usual. Count should give you five. So get up bounds handy because it gives you your last index number. So you know it's index four is the last one within the uh, uh, array. Uh, so that's navigating through simple arrays. So this is without using any sort of filters or anything. We'll get into that in the next demo. Um, but there are any questions about uh, navigating uh, simple arrays? Oh uh, yeah, I've got one actually. Yep. Let's come across this the other day. The very last one, how you got like an, an array dot count. Yep. Now, there's been times when I've um, uh, had to run queries on um, data, and if I, it, the object return could just be one, or it could be three or four. All right. And I've always found with when you do dot count on uh, an object that's been returned that has more than one, you obviously get a number. But if, if there is only one object returned, it, it isn't actually in an array. It's just, it's just the object itself. So count would be nothing. I think it's what Jordan was saying before, wasn't it? If it's less than, if it's one object, it's only an object, it's not an array. Yeah, exa exactly. So I'm just curious if anyone has any, like, like, like I sometimes do logging where I might say, oh, I've, I've, I've made this call to get this data, and this is how many items that were returned. You know, it could be one, could be, 10 could be 20. But obviously, if it's only one, count comes back as zero. And uh, the only way that I've found that seems to work is if I um, pipe it to a measure object and get the count property on there to actually can... say, oh, yeah, you've only got one or you've got 20. But it'll work in both scenarios. I was curious if anybody yeah. else has had any other suggestion. You can, yeah, you can do this. I've, I've put it in, a, in the chat. So you declare that, uh, yeah, even that is fine, the one that Jordan mentioned. So either that or you predefine the variable as an array. So that could then, you know, uh, return, right. because it is true that when, when one object is returned, it doesn't classify that as an array. So okay. you would have to, right. yeah, so you would have to either predefine, yeah, array dollar $x or whatever is equal to whatever object you're getting. So that would. Um, oh, I see, okay. Yeah. All right, cool. What's on the screen there. Oh, you can also use at. Yes, yes. Things, so, so, so uh, effectively, you'd just be casting it as an array. Hey, this object yeah. is an array. And then you can yeah. obviously leverage the objects, uh, or sorry, the, um, the properties out of that. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then, yeah, then you can do whatever um, condition you have dot count is greater than zero or whatever. 
Cool. Already here. Uh, moving on to demo three, which is navigating through object arrays. Um, so this is a bit more fun. Uh, we've got our first object array here on the top, which we just print in. Oh, the stack trace thing. Lovely. So we've got our uh, objects right here with all our lovely fellowship people in. Uh, quite a simple one. So again, all the usual um, things apply uh, to go through these. Uh, so you can go through the indexes with the square bracket, zero minus one, select a range, select different ones. Uh, but then it gets fun when you can access properties uh, by using the index from the array. So you can see here we're selecting just the first name of the first object in the array. Um, so we're getting Frodo out of that. And again, obviously we can get all of the last names out of all of the uh, objects within the array. Um, we can also use select object to expand the property, which is a bit more verbose. So um, there's probably some performance things in there, but generally... And a bit of the select object way is that if you're piping that into something else, it will continue yeah. that pipeline. Well, where you put it in like the dot last name, it will get it all, all out of the array and then pipe that whole array in. Yep. And then with the filtering aware object, again, the same, just a bit more filtering if you want to do. So we get the single object out. Uh, you can also use the where method um, as well. Does everyone use where method often? I just tend to not use the, the dot where method. I just tend to pipe to where object. Uh, I think it's just I force a habit. Use, I always use dot where because it's far much faster than when you when you pipe it to anything, oh yeah, it really comes. Yeah, yeah it, it, it's it's interesting because I, I actually asked on Twitter um, this exact question, which was yeah, what about where is where? Um, and it generally the consensus is that generally people will use where object, which you know it is what it is. Obviously, you know there's performance. I, I tend to go for verbosity before I start going for performance. Mm -hmm just for ease of writing and reading and comprehension. And then if things are too slow, then you go in there and things, but I, like I try not to. If you're dealing stop. with like thousands and thousands of objects, then where dot where method makes much more sense or oh, yeah, for, sure. for each method even would make much more sense. I, uh, but if it's just like few objects, you can use where object. Yeah, there's, there's a, um, it's actually interesting question though. Who uses where object? but doesn't use it, uh, actually uses the, um, it's not the native script, um, it's not the script block, the um, the property type one way, but essentially you just go where object, and then you essentially write your property name, your um, your comparison operator, and then your value. So you're not writing an explicit script block, but you just, yeah, exactly. Yep, I use that. Yep, yeah. that's that's faster as well. Yeah, that, that actually accesses, faster. yep, that actually accesses uh, the, the uh, it supports filtering as well. And uh, there's, a, there's a complete dedicated chapter in, in PowerShell Conference Book 1, I think, which, which shows about, I mean, which, which gives example of, um, the, you know, without using the script block. Yep. So I'm guessing the way the script block works is it obviously needs to invoke. So that's where your, that's where your overhead's going to be at. So, but I don't, I'd like, that, that's kind of just speculation. I don't really understand. Like I mostly pull apart the source code. Um, yeah. All right. Okay. Cool. Moving on uh, to updating items in simple array. Again, very easy. All using indexes. We've got our update array here, which is all our blokes in the uh, fellowship again. Uh, and then we can see there, Saruman's on the end. He's not a good guy. He's a bad guy. So we want to get rid of him and replace him with Mary. So again, we can just use the uh, indexes to select uh, who we want to replace and do an equals and then we get very straight in there and yeah, got to get it in there. So fairly simple, not a lot to it. Um, or on a simple array of just values, uh, we're not talking about objects here or anything like that. Um, so pretty easy here, you just select your index and insert it in. Uh, and I think on the back end, it will probably, does it replace the value or does it create the new array? As you get. Should replace it. Yeah. Yeah, because they're all fixed size to begin with. So I think it just replaces it and then bins the old one. Was that? Well, that's my end. 
Uh, where it gets to the fun stuff is when you're dealing with objects. We've got our object right here to update. Uh, so we see here that uh, we've got the fourth one, uh, Peregrine Took. We want to use his uh, uh, nickname of Pippin. Um, so we're just going to get the object array, select which one he is. So minus two there, we see uh, dot first name equals Pippin. And then we have updated his value, Pippin. Uh, you can also obviously iterate through with for each and dot for each uh, through a loop if you want to do a whole bunch of things on the array. Uh, and that's just simple for each uh, character and object array. And then we're just going to set all the last names to of the fellowship. Oh, wrong one. I've used too many things. Of the fellowship. So simple enough. That's handy if you just want to update, obviously, a value on all the objects within and just quickly look through them all. And uh, you can also use the dot for each, I think you were saying, Rana, as well. Yeah. Just go through, obviously, you can see on arrays, because we're inheriting from the dot net subsystem. There's all the usual things there. Um, clear clone compared to. Uh, we're not going to go into these today. Um, they're all in the about arrays uh, documentation in the Bioshock doc site. It can be very handy um, for when you want to uh, obviously work more with arrays and obviously faster because these are obviously inheriting all the uh, C sharp methods, I believe, from the, the base class. Uh, so we move on through iteration through arrays. So this is probably your bed and butter with arrays. You know, you're always iterating through them. So we've got our first iterator array here. Uh, and then we're just going to output a, a string character name Frodo. So we're just piping straight to for each object here and then character name PS item. So PS item is obviously denoting the objects being passed along the pipeline. So fairly simple stuff. Let's keep checking the chat to see if anything comes up. Yeah. Uh, PS item, is that the same as um, dollar sign underscore? Correct. Uh, yeah. 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 So it's just the pipeline object as it comes along. It's just a nicer way of putting it in instead of doing the dollar underscore. I tend to use dollar underscore though if I'm accessing values on the object being passed through the pipeline. So if you're accessing like a last name on the object, I would do dollar underscore dot last name. Um, Robin um, just asked everyone, what is the um, the dollar underscore PS item preference? If I'm passing the whole object through, I tend to use PS item, but if I'm accessing uh, a value on the object, I tend to use just dollar underscore dot and then the property I'm trying to access. I think that's just that's just mainly what I'm used to, to be perfectly honest. That comes down to the personal preference entirely. I think some people use PS item and some people like to use dollar underscore. Yeah. If you want to be... I usually me, use I dollar underscore myself. Me just too. What I'm used to. I think it's just kind of house style. So whatever your, your house style is, your code style is for your, your project or mm. whatever. So I think as long as everyone sticks to the same thing, you're in a good boat. Um, but if it changes around, obviously. Yeah, just change it every second uh, line. Okay, I'm going to put another for each object in here. G'day, bro. It's going to be a dollar <laughs> score. Have fun. So, yeah. Um, actually, there's one thing I actually want to quickly mention. Um, this is one of the interesting things I, I noted about um, running methods in collections. So if you've got a collection of objects um, within, let's say, I use, I use get process because get process is the one that I love to demo with. But essentially, if you run get process, get process um, has um, each object has a, a method called kill. And so if you actually want to um, run that method across all of them, you can. Now, I wouldn't do it because you'll kill all your processes, Alex. <laughs> um, but essentially what it, you can do is um, if you have, let's say you need to run a method on those, on a, a collection of objects, you don't actually have to iterate through within a for each loop or anything like that. You can actually just run it natively. Like if you were to select a property and then return all those um, objects from that, um, return um, all those um, values from that property. So it's a pretty, um, it's it's an interesting way of doing it, but it's actually, I actually think it's really cool because you can obviously just run, run methods. Yeah, so 
I mean, like, so if we go, uh, I think this is, is it process name? Um, it's, I think it's name. I think the, um, the, the property, um, the property name is just name. Um, I use MS paint because that's the safest. Process <laughs> name. Yeah. Oh no, it, it, it's name. It's name. It's name. I don't think that's name. Uh, process name. Could be both. Yes, we got those. So what you saying? You pass it to. So what you can do is pop, pop it into an, um, pop it into a variable. All right. Okay. Ah. Yep. And now if you go uh, kill and then call the kill method, and you actually go specify the method, it'll um you actually can't like it won't resolve because it's um yeah oh, access is denied. <laughs> yeah. So it's right, I call it, but it's denied. Yeah, that's a good that's a good outcome. But essentially, um, it's a really cool way of actually um, um running methods without actually having to invoke it for each. No, that's pretty good. I didn't know about that. Yeah, I didn't know about it until um, I was kind of playing around with it, and I was like, oh. So, yeah. Anyway. Pretty good. Anyway. That's not Jordan. It's a pretty fundamental thing in PowerShell, so you shouldn't be confusing people too much. Mm -hmm. Am I confusing people? No, no, no. That, that's about the dollar underscore first, like, dollar, dollar PS item. Like, if you see dollar oh. underscore... Yeah. That's pretty fundamental with PowerShell, so you usually people know what it is. I think it comes from Perl. Jeffrey Snow took that from Perl. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, that was in the book. I'm pretty sure they said it. It was from Perl. Yeah, dollar underscores the inline object in Perl. Uh, in the same way, in PowerShell, when it goes through the inline object, uh, Perl does the same thing. And again, here we can see we're using the dot for each uh, that Rod was talking about there. Same thing, spits it out. Um, it's less verbose uh, and faster, I think you're saying, Ron? Yes, it is. It is. Uh, it is really faster when you when you uh, if you compare the the timings and there's in the PowerShell conference book one they have given the timings as well, like measured the timings. Uh, these native uh, for each and where methods are really fast as compared to using the the traditional way like where object especially mm -hmm. when you're iterating through like thousands of objects definitely and yeah, then, yeah. Uh, yeah and then even like if you want even even high performance instead of creating an array or if instead of creating ps collection of ps objects you create hash table hash table is the fastest yeah but to create a hash table you like if you're creating it manually like doing a dot add that will be faster but if you're like casting something to a hash table that's still creating the array, then it'll cast it. So you're not really getting any speed benefits that way. It, it really just depends on how you create it and how you're adding those elements. I was going to also quickly add, um, I'm just going to throw this question out there. So I've seen in some scripts within the for each method that people actually use param blocks um, within it. Does anyone explain why like I'm just interested to sort of understand why I've never seen uh, RAM blocks in I, I remember seeing it in somebody's code and I just thought I didn't like I wanted to understand why and I spent ages trying to work it out but I just couldn't understand why there was a param block um, is this inside of a function you mean no inside of for each method oh right yeah no I'm, I haven't seen that Unless you put, can you pass arguments into a for each method? No. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. I mean, can you pass arguments in for each method? I don't think so. That's the only reason why you would have a param block, isn't it? If you're passing arguments in. Yeah, Boggles the mind. You should find it and post it in Slack. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be good. Maybe someone just did a cut and paste error or something. Mm. Yeah, it's probably just a stack overflow thing. Copy pasta. Off they went. Still worked. Left it. Uh, switch statements. So you can pass arrays into switch statements. So if you want to trigger one a value, you can do. So uh, simple construction here, switch. And we've got our array we're passing in. And then we just want to trigger on Samwise. We're going to say, hello, Mr. Frodo. And then the default for everyone else is going to be, you're not Samwise and Brave. Pretty simple stuff. It can be handy. That actually uh, caught me up the other day. But in switch? Um, yeah. Or case statement? Uh, oh, no, 
a switch a switch statement against an array. I was um, writing, um, I was testing some code with assumption analysis, and um, I was like, why is the iteration through multiple? And then I'm like, wait a second, is it an array? It's an array. <laughs> Just run through multiple times, but yeah, it, it, yeah. I actually didn't know. I didn't know of that until then. So I was like, that's really cool. Yeah, I quite like switch statements. I like I like the structure of switch statements. Can be quite um, easy to, to go through and get stuff triggered. There was one, one little other tidbit I didn't know the other day until I actually went and read the documentation is that you can actually put an expression in your switch statement. So you're not you don't necessarily have to do. Um, a, a literal string match or a regex expression, you can actually write a custom expression. So you just write a script block um, where the literal match is, and then yeah, like it's essentially treated like a where object um, script block. So I was like, oh, that's oh, wow. really cool. Yeah. The yeah, switches on PowerShell are really good. There's a lot of options you can use. Yeah. Is that better, Robert? Okay. Sorry. All right. I know we're running through these pretty fast. Uh, it's a pretty simple um, overview of arrays. I don't want to go too deep because uh, one of the, the, the feedbacks that uh, Wayne, Michael, and myself went through over Christmas was maybe last year we went a bit too too crazy on the technical depth stuff. Um, so we kept keeping it a bit more high level this year. Um, so it's not as meaty as you're used to. Sorry about that. Also, um, I've been working a lot with COVID. So. <laughs> So it's all right having an array, but how do we add stuff to arrays? We want to add stuff to it. So you can see here we've got our first simple array um, of our favorite fellowship members. And that's really cool. But now Aragorn's tipped up and he wants to join the fellowship. So we want to add him through. Uh, so the simple uh, notation that PowerShell uses is the plus equals. Uh, you might have seen this in other languages, pretty simple. Uh, and there you go, done. And then we've added Aragorn to the uh, Fellowship, uh, one thing to note, as Rana will probably quite relevantly point out, that it's incredibly slow and cost costly. Yes, because yeah. one of the main reasons is it, it when we add any object to the array, the PowerShell it array. It creates a new array. Absolutely. It, it yeah. trashes the old array and recreates a new array. So let's say you have 1,000, one item. If you add 1,000, two item in the array, it's a new it array. Trash. Yeah, it would trash the uh, uh, array and then recreate it. And probably that's one of the main reasons it's it's really expensive yeah. in terms of performance. Yeah, so if you're dealing with like 100 things, it's not too bad. But when you start getting to thousands, it really lags down, which we'll go into on the, uh, the next demo. Uh, and that's fundamentally because when you create uh, an array in PowerShell using the, the uh, uh, open close brackets, it's, it's fundamentally a fixed size array when you first create it. And it can never change after that point. When you change it, it just creates a new one, creates a new reference, and away you go. So can be it, it, it's fine when you're using a small amount of objects. To be perfectly honest, I rarely, if ever, use just a straight PowerShell array. I pretty much always use .NET generic lists. Yeah, um, me too. Yeah, it's just I've used them for a while now. It's just easier to to go on those. And also, um, you'll see it makes easier uh, adding, removing, index matching, and doing all the rest of it. Uh, so you'll see here, oh, wait, there's a, a dot add uh, on the array. You can see here. So if we go adding array, add, see there's an add method. Does that cool. add method only that? apply to um, type string? Because I don't think um, it would apply uh, to an object. Because if you needed to add, you need the exact object type. Yeah, well, it's not going to do anything either because oh, you can it see here. Six size, yeah. Yeah, so that's where we're coming in, saying, "Oh, yeah, use that." Um, I think the add method's there because obviously inherit inherits from the base class when you create the partial array, yep. which is why it's there. However, because it's a forced fix size, it won't actually add. Yep. Uh, so if you you're trying to add that way with a dot add method, it's going to fail because the collection is of fixed size, and that's what Rana and I were saying before. Uh, so you can see here, we're going to get a uh, array of objects. Here, just from the uh, the services. See here, adding object. Ah, oh, created that. Adding object. Oh. oh man, it's been a long week. Also, I've got a new keyboard because I went to IKEA two weeks ago and bought all new stuff for a home office. So I'm on a new keyboard that my fingers still aren't used to yet. 
which is quite annoying because I keep hitting the wrong key. We see there we've got all the services of the running. That's great, but now I want to add all the stop services to it as well. So the same notation plus equals and then get service for object stop. And then just add to it. So you can see there quite fast. Um, and we've got all the stop comms as well. So again, when you're working with small amounts of things, it's it's pretty just there. Um, I think the rule of thumb is in UI development is if it's less than 100 milliseconds, it's instantaneous to the end user. Um, so it's pretty fast there if you deal with just a couple of hundred things. Uh, you can also add two arrays together. So we've got our first array here and our second array. So A, B, well, A, B, D, I can't spell, E, F, G. Uh, and then we create our third array by adding the two together. And then we get A, B, D. Another array. Yeah, A, B, D. <laughs> My terrible spelling. That was that was last night after a long day uh, with Windows Virtual Desktop. Uh, so you add them together like that as well. Uh, handy thing that is, obviously, you've still got your first adding array and your second adding array still in memory, so you can still access them as separate ones if you want to. Uh, but then, obviously, you get your third one if you want to do conglomeration. Uh, any questions or pointers on that that I've missed out that people want to say just on quickly adding simply? Uh, so this is just partial arrays, but not into .NET arrays yet. Uh, the, does it does it sorry go ahead john uh just saying same with the dot add method the dot remove method doesn't do anything for a, an actual array yeah it'll fail as well because it's fixed size hmm. uh, i bought a keyboard from ikea no i got the keyboard from jb hi-fi uh i got the rest of it from ikea i got the uh the microsoft ergonomic wow <laughs> that's a pretty big keyboard yeah, it's actually really nice. I used to use the ergonomic 400s years ago. Microsoft ones, they're really good. Um, I did have the extra tilt on it, but yeah. W says, um, can you then add things to the first and second array, or do you need to add to the third array? If you add it to the first array, it would only be in the first array. The third array is not like a concurrent object where anything you add to the other ones would then be added to the third one. You'd need to add to the third one again because it's just a I'd imagine it's just a reference point or anything. A lot of people like Jordan probably know that one. Um, I was I was wondering, um, do uh, arrays support nested arrays? Like, can I add like five different arrays? Three dimensional in... arrays. Yeah, yeah, you can do yeah. arrays of arrays, AOAs, mm. arrays of arrays. I used that. So I, I used that idea. Um, I, I was using two dimensional arrays when I was working with my battlefield aimbot. So yeah. Mm. I guess into I guess into fun stuff. And then what we were talking about before, .NET arrays. Um, so inherently, I uh, use these a lot because the the PowerShell notation, the at symbol, uh, and the open close brackets, like we talked about throughout this talk, uh, just creates a fixed size array, uh, which is fine for when you're just doing a couple of things, a couple of hundred of things. But then when you get into a thousand things, uh, you will start noticing big slowdown. So if you're starting to do things in like Active Directory, you're pulling in like 1,500, 2,000 users, you can start, you're going to see pretty heavy slowdowns. Uh, and we can demonstrate this here, just with, we're going to create just a, a simple empty array here, big array. And we'll just do a measure command expression. We're going to go from zero to 10,000. And then for each, we're just going to add it to uh, the big array. So this is just a, a straight one. So you can see that it took two seconds, uh, two, three, nine. So we're going to do a list big array here. So what we're using here, you can see I'm using uh, the generic list PS object type array. So this is calling the um, C sharp uh, generic list class. And then we're saying the type is PS object, so just a generic generic PS object. You can also type the array to a string or int if you want as well, uh, and that will allow obviously any string or int to be added to the array. And we're going to colon colon new to generate a new one. So for, those, um, so for those guys who are not familiar with colon colon new method, essentially what um, is being said there is this, um, is you're denoting the class and then colon colon new dictates um, a PowerShell is, is a is a is a method that basically it's a PowerShell method creates a new yeah, yeah it creates a new new class of that um, from from that creates a new uh, class of, new, yeah new object from that. Class, it's yeah. Essentially, it's the same as new object, but um, yeah, yeah, just kind of. Well, sure. I was just going to say, um, you expecting? Well, um, what's the difference between doing colon colon new or using new object? I mean, is there any pros and cons? They're exactly the same. 
the ladder is a lot slower. Well, not a lot, but the ladder is slower. Yeah. So if you've got PowerShell 5, use colon colon new. If you're dealing with older stuff, then you have to use new object. So we're doing slower though, colon colon. New object slower. Mm. Oh, yeah. it, it has to deal with all sorts of other stuff. Like you can create com objects, task to sort oh. of. Um, so it's pulling in the actual like new objects, and all that the rest of that overhead. Got you. It's all, I'm guessing it's that, that'd be the, yeah, because that's the overhead of the actual func, or the command line itself. And then when it goes, I need to create an actual instantiate a new object. It just goes, okay. Yeah. Colon, Again, this colon, is just false yeah. habit. I've, all, I've always just used colon, colon. And then the, the .NET method. Yeah. Uh, it's great. So embarrassingly there, it wasn't actually much, much faster. Uh, two seconds, 239 milliseconds, and then the .NET one was 239. Uh, it was much slower when I did it the other day. So let's try it again. I've just upped the numbers. This is more like it. PowerShell there, it's swinging away. Hopefully my color scheme is very inoffensive to people within VS Code. I know people are very into the color schemes of VS Code. What uh, what team are you using? Uh, this is Monokai Pro. Oh, so yeah. I'm also a big fan of Grovebox. Mm -hmm. At least your pipe characters aren't italics. No, no. I do like, uh, I've got Fero Code here, so I'm using ligatures. So you do get your nice uh, ligatures coming along, so. It does look like that, and you've got your greater than or equal to get nicely done. It's always handy. Pity PowerShell yeah. doesn't use that. Uh, no, no, it's very, very annoying. The other day, I actually, um, what was I doing? I was getting really pissed off because something wasn't working. It's because I was doing equals equals instead of dash EQ. Made that mistake um, many times. Yeah. Wound me up something chronic. I was just like, oh, why aren't you equal? And I was like, oh, yeah, that's not that. I did that. Yeah, so you see that? Yep. Sorry, go. No, I was just saying, I, was, I did that once when I came from a project knee deep in C sharp, and then I kind of wrote a whole bunch of PowerShell script, and I was just not working. And it's like, you know, blah, 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 equals, equals, blah. And I'm like, uh, okay. I've got to use hyphen yeah. EQ. It is quite annoying, especially when. Not equal is not is so obviously e, e, well, no, I mean you've got equal so dash eq mm. and then I just always type for not equal dash n eq not n e mm. gets me every time every time it's also quite annoying because every other programming language in the world I think although I think Perl doesn't actually uh, just tends to use yeah equals equals and greater than or less than as we see there, the PowerShell one took 57 seconds when we bumped it up to 20,000 items. Um, so let's bump up the dot .NET array one, see where we get to. Well, I have a feeling this is more of an issue with the integrated PowerShell session I'm running. Is this uh, running on RTX? Running on what? Is this running on RTX? What's RTX? Ray tracing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> NVIDIA's ray tracing. Oh, uh, don't worry. It's a gamer thing when basically it's like you have um, RTX on and RTX um, on, RTX off and RTX on. I like it. Let's restart the session. Essentially, what you should see is the .NET one is much much faster, which I'm sure we all know. <laughs> Even if it is still the same speed, you can remove items from a an actual .NET list. Yeah, so what we're going to get into down is actually adding and removing things in a much easier manner. So 14 seconds. This worked perfectly last night, just so everyone knows. You should have recorded it last night. <laughs> it, it was like lightning. It was just like boom, boom, boom. Well, I am on page 51. Oh, it came out there. You should, oh no, because you just started on a different version. I did. I should have just run it all at the same time. No, it's all good. It's all good. Um, demo gods try. We'll see here. What, 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 while I'm waiting for that? Oh, yeah, nine seconds on that one. So PowerShell 7 actually runs PowerShell arrays a bit faster. Mm. 
So you see here while we're waiting for that underneath, we've got a wait list, hey, eight seconds. So it's a bit faster, but trust me, in actual usage, I'm sure everyone else, like Jordan and Rana can attend to, it's way, way faster to use the .NET array and a lot easier, which we'll go into next. Uh, you'll also see in probably quite a few script tutorials, uh, system collections array list. You can use that. However, it's deprecated and has been for a while now. Um, so they recommend you use the generics list. Um, you can still use array list. I still see it around in tons of places, but yeah, generally in a normal day to day, uh, you just use the uh, system collections to generate list and then you can type it, you know, here's object string, uh, int, however you want to go there. Um, and then again, as we saw in the uh, demonstration above, calling it is pretty simple. Uh, you can just call the straight square bracket system collections generic list and then what you want to type it as, and then the square brackets again. You can also shorten that by using use namespace, I think, at the top, and then put in the systems collection list. Um, so you can then shorten that down later on if you want to correct it. I tend to just write it out like this rather than use namespace. Uh, so again, we'll just get all our services here. So we want to loop through these. So we will loop through all the objects in the, uh, the .NET array. Um, so what I'm going to do here is we're just going to add them to the generic list array we uh, created earlier above there. And we're going to use the .add method. So this is what Jordan was talking about, where it's much easier to add uh, to these arrays because they will vary in size as you add and remove objects to them, uh, which makes it a lot easier uh, and a lot quicker than doing the, the plus equals method. So we're just going to loop through these and we're going to save each service in services. Um, if the service state is equals running, then we're going to add it to the array with the dot add method here. We just pass the object in the dot add. Uh, I've got void at the beginning there. That just avoids any like crappy output coming to your, your output. And the, uh, the line which dot uh, net methods can kick out some crap sometimes. So we see the checklist array there. We've got all our running things. Great. That's awesome. For, but, for a generic list, you shouldn't have to have the void for the add method. It's only an array list that it returns the index. Oh, is uh, it? But remove, you still need it. I just tend to have void in there. Hey, there you go. Yeah. Right. So yeah, this whenever people use an actual array list, um, it will return the index which it is which it was added, which is a bit useless. Oh yeah, yeah. So it spits out the the index. That was pushed in at. Got it, yeah. And again, for each services, we're going to remove the running ones. It's running. Done. So now the array should be. No, generic list array. Ah, it's supposed to be removed. Again, this all worked last night. <laughs> There we go, empty. So very handy because otherwise it's actually quite hard to remove objects from the array if you're not using a .NET array. Um, can be quite handy. I tend to use this uh, to add. So I have generally, I'll be iterating through an array and I'll have an end state where I want to know what errored out in a try catch and what succeeded in a try catch. Um, so I'll generally have two arrays you now success and error or an error array and just a normal array. Um, and then obviously if it hits the catch, it gets added to the error array and you'll dynamically add a new type member to add an error message in there. So you can output um, to an email or something like that. So it can be quite handy. And again, you can also iterate through these. Obviously I'm just using the generic for each structure here um, that you see everywhere, but as Rana was saying, you can still use the, the built-in methods of the array, the dot for each there to go through them. Uh, and that's about it, really. So I didn't go too deep into anything. Uh, I think it's actually been a pretty good discussion on arrays. I've learned a couple of things. Um, any questions about .NET arrays? Oh, someone's put some stuff in there. Run advantage to everyone. Oh, yeah. Okay, same as x equals system collection of ps objects equals new. Oh, yeah. Yep. So that's it. Thank you for coming to my TED talk. Yep. I know it's pretty pretty light. There wasn't too crazy on anything, so we still hit. Quarter past seven, right? Yep, quarter past seven. Um, because oh, I think the cutoff was seven thirty. So yeah, seven thirty. No, 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 no. So we got fifteen minutes for questions. Um, I'll just yes. yeah. Um, I'll quickly yeah reiterate. Um, next month is lightning talk. So yeah. Um, if you're interested, let us know. Um, send me a PM. 
um, directly on Discord or um, send me a PM in Slack. So yeah.